Good morning, everybody. We welcome you back to our online Bible class uh, here at Preston Crest uh, Church of Christ. Again, I'm Mike Pipkin. I'm one of the elders here at Preston Crest. We're trying something a little new from the technology standpoint, uh, utilizing the technology afforded to us by the Apple iPhone 11 uh, to see how it works in terms of catch capturing not only the image imaging but the sound, uh, as well as just everything that's that's part of of the presenting a lesson in today's day and age where we can't right now meet in person the way that we would prefer. Uh, today's lesson uh, from the life and ministry of Paul, and we're glad that you're here to enjoy this, uh, is on the period of transition from T Saul's time of waiting and contemplation and study and reflection to the rest of his life as a minister and a missionary. So let's set the stage since we left off on this part of, of the story a couple of weeks ago. Uh, next week, we're going to get into Paul's first missionary journey. So this week, we're going to talk about that transition period before that began. And this map that we've got here sort of establishes the uh, setting and it shows where the transition begins. Antioch was in ancient Syria but it's now in what we would know as modern day Turkey. And it was Barnabas, we recall, who had vouched for Saul on his first post Damascus visit to Jerusalem. Let's look at Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 24. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and he saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them to all remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. It was Barnabas, we, we recall, who vouched for Saul during that first post-Damascus visit to Jerusalem. And you're going to remember that he was originally from Cyprus. He was a Jew from the tribe of Levi. His actual name was Joseph, but Luke tells us that the Jesus followers gave him the nickname Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. So when the Jerusalem leaders received this disturbing news about fresh developments in the Jesus community at Antioch, and they wanted to send somebody who would understand the outlook of Greek-speaking communities and the concerns of the Jerusalem church itself, Barnabas was the natural choice. So what were those fresh developments? What would Jewish people, particularly in a community like Antioch or in a community like Tarsus, where Saul was at the time, where dispersed Jews had relocated, what would these Jewish people think of the suggestion that the one God had done what he had promised by sending a crucified Messiah. What would this mean for Jewish identity? Was this good news simply for Jewish people or might it be for everyone? Syrian Antioch, even more than Tarsus, was exactly the kind of place where this sort of question would come quickly to the fore. It boasted a bustling community of of a mixture of cultures, ethnic groups, religious traditions, including a substantial Jewish population. It was a classic melting pot. So it's not surprising that some of these early Jewish followers would find their way there. And it can't also be surprising that these, Jew, uh, that these uh, Jesus followers were eager to share the name of Jesus with Jews as well as non-Jews. Now, to say that this new project, this new community was going to present a challenge, that's a gross understatement. And Barnabas must have realized this and must have seen that in order to even 
sustain such a thing, one would have to help people really kind of think through what all of this meant, and that's going to mean teaching. Well, who did Barnabas know who had that kind of knowledge and the eager energy and the way of, with words that, communicate, that could communicate that? Well, there was one obvious candidate. Let's continue in Acts chapter 11, verse uh, 25 and 26. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So Saul came to Antioch and he worked with Barnabas and the local Antioch leaders for an entire year, teaching and guiding this new and growing community. Now, much as we might like to have been a fly on the wall <laughs> during those early days, all that we can really be sure of is that the ways of reading scripture <clears throat> and interpreting the events of the life of Jesus that we find already full grown in Paul's letters, they had to have been taking shape, not only in his head and in his heart, but in the life of the Antioch community. So pretty much every idea he later articulated had to have been road tested, if you will, through the teaching of a great number of people here in Antioch, in this Antioch community. So let's talk some this morning about Antioch and what we could call the Antioch Church of Christ. You know, Luke, uh, Luke also notes that it was in Antioch in this period that the followers of Jesus were first called Christianoi. Messiah people. The only other places in the New Testament where the word Christianoi is used is when Herod Agrippa is actually teasing Paul that he was trying to make him a, a Christian, and that's in Acts chapter 26, verse 28. We'll get to that several weeks down the road. And then when Paul refers to people suffering as Christians in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, I think it's safe to say, though, that the Jesus followers, the Messiah people, were making a name for themselves, so to speak, on, on that uh, one that had deep Jewish roots. They're talking about the Messiah, of course, and the Messiah comes from the messianic prophecy that had been taught to them, but with a different reach and a different power. So, before we really get to talking about the Antioch Church of Christ, let's, let's touch on the topic of transition. Transition is always about change, isn't it? You know, me, I'm not a big fan of change. And I, I really don't know people that are fans of change. It threatens our comfort. Uh, it interrupts our routines. It challenges our priorities. It introduces anxiety. Yet I'm convinced that living a life of obedience is impossible if we're not willing to change. In our study of the life of Paul, we've already seen extraordinary changes in his life and how he's handled him handled those changes. And they've left marks on him in ways that prepared him uniquely for the tasks that God had set out for him. And the biggest change is about to come. Now for, for me and, and my family, I think of eight years ago as the biggest time of, of change. For those that don't know me, we, uh, my wife and I, we have twins. And those are the only children that we have. And so in, in, I graduated from high school here in Dallas in the year 2012. And so that was a huge year of transition for us as we went from parents of two kids going to high school to being empty nesters and to not having anyone at home at all. And for those of you that have 
uh, have experienced that, you know exactly what we're talking about. But also during that year, that year of 2012, uh, our family in, endured a health scare, a very significant health scare that we certainly didn't anticipate, certainly didn't want, but it was one that provided us with, uh, with the opportunity to serve one another within our family in ways that we'd never really contemplated. Additionally, right here at Preston Crest during 2012, uh, an, opportun an opportunity presented itself for my wife to, <clears throat> to work more closely with our children's ministry. And that provided me with an opportunity to work more closely with our children's ministry, something that I've continued to do for the last eight years, working with our third through sixth graders. These were all things that happened all within one year, really within a period of months within that year, that were, that, that changed really what we've, what me and my family have been doing for the last eight years. Allowing ourselves to be changed, to mold, and to make us something different is uncomfortable. And at times it's downright painful. You know, if we were like clay, moldable and flexible and easy to reshape, changes would be a whole lot easier. <laughs> but we're not like potter, uh, like, uh, we're more like pottery, I guess we should say. We're not like clay, we're more like pottery. We're brittle and we're inflexible. And yet, here's the metaphor. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 29, verse 16. You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, you did not make me. Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 45, verse 49. Woe to those who quarrel with their master, those who are nothing but pots herds among the pots herds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say the potter has no hands? And Paul even talks about this metaphor in Romans. Let's look at Romans chapter 9, verse 21. Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? When our wills are like clay, we understand that change is inevitable when we place ourselves in God's hands. And David talks about this in Psalms chapter 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Here David is calling upon God to change him in ways that only God can. You know, and David wrote this prayer of forgiveness and cleansing after Nathan had called him out for committing adultery with Bathsheba, and he knew where he was. And he recognized that only God could change him into the man that he was supposed to be. So, turning back to the scene where we left Saul and Barnabas in the book of Acts, they're, they're part of the staff, if you will, now at the, the Antioch Church of Christ. And that church is growing. Lives are being transformed. And an entire culture had come under the influence of the Spirit of God. Everyone and everything is rocking and rolling along. And then suddenly, God steps in and everything changes. I suppose it's possible that some in the Antioch congregation weren't enamored with the idea of sending Saul and Barnabas abroad. But I don't think Saul questioned it for one second. 
he knew about change. So on, on the way to Damascus to persecute Christians, a bright light shone and he was converted, if you will, to Jesus Christ. His eyes were opened to what, had, what he'd been taught by Gamaliel for years and years to understand at that point from that face-to-face -face contact with Jesus Christ exactly what all of those teachings really meant. He then lived and served alongside the people that he was earlier persecuting. Then there were the years in Arabia and in Damascus and then to Jerusalem and then of all things back to his home, original home, in Tarsus, living as a converted Jew in his hometown. Then Barnabas knocks on the door and he heads to Antioch with Barnabas to teach. He and Barnabas teach there for a year, then God decides uh, to change things up again, putting them on the road now. Let's look at Acts chapter 13, verses one through four. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. So the Church of Christ in Antioch is thriving, and while it didn't have actual uh, apostles in, in its midst, it did have prophets with the special gift of inspiration experienced by Old Testament prophets as well as teachers. And as you can see here from Acts chapter 13, Barnabas is listed at the top of this list of, of prophets and teachers. Barnabas and Simeon and Lucius and Menean and Saul at the end. He was originally sent uh, to Antioch, as I mentioned before, by the church in Jerusalem. And he had just returned, uh, he had just returned from Jerusalem with Saul and John Mark, who we're going to come to know in the coming weeks. So he's, there's no question that he is a recognized leader, Barnabas, a recognized leader in the Antioch congregation. In Acts chapter 12, verse 24, Luke wrote that the word of God continued to increase and to spread, and the church in Antioch was a huge part of that. They had leaders there that were laying a strong foundation based upon the Word of God. One of, one of the, if not the most important factors in deciding where you should attend church is the commitment to consistent, substantive teaching. It isn't enough just to attend church simply because you have friends who go there or because you like a particular program. This quote from Charles Spurgeon, uh, I think says a lot. Sermons should have real teaching in them and the doctrine should be sound, substantial and abundant. We do not enter the pulpit to talk for talk's sake. We have instructions to convey important, uh, convey important to the last degree and we cannot afford to utter petty nothings. Our range of subjects is all but boundless, and we cannot therefore be excused if our discourses are threadbare and devoid of substance. If we speak as ambassadors of God, we need never complain of want of matter, for our message is full to overflowing. The entire gospel must be presented from the pulpit. The whole faith once delivered to the saints must be proclaimed by us. The truth as it is in Jesus must be instructively declared so that, 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 so that the people may not mere, merely hear but know the joyful sound. Nothing can compensate for the absence of teaching. I apologize for the typo on here. <laughs> it's correctly spelled. Spell check didn't catch that. But I love this quote. I love this quote from Charles, uh, Charles Spurgeon. And while here at Preston Crest, and I've, I've, before I was an elder, I was a deacon for 20 years, maybe a little bit more than 20 years. 
uh, one of the areas of my focus was on adult education, working first with Bill Moody, who was our uh, educational minister for, for many, many years, and then uh, working alongside our current adult education minister, Robert Stolte. And the commitment to the teaching of God's Word permeates throughout our adult education program here at Preston Crest. If, if you're not a member here at Preston Crest, I think our adult Bible co uh, class connections is one of the vital means by which you can become part of this, of this family of God. Not only because of the, the connections that we can, uh, we can have with one another, the relationships that we can build uh, with one another, but the emphasis that our adult Bible classes put on the teaching of God's Word has been consistent for decades, even before I became involved with adult Bible classes. I, it was just so easy for me to, to stand alongside Bill Moody and then uh, Robert Stolte because of the programs that, uh, that have been put in place that allow our Bible class connections to, to be almost operate as small churches, being able to serve one another, but everything is centered around the teaching of God's Word. And that is simply something that we won't change here at Preston Crest because of its importance as summarized here from this statement by Charles Spurgeon. And so the, the things that you see here and the things that are happening, uh, happening in uh, from the pulpit and from our adult Bible classes, these are the things that are happening in Antioch. The word is being spread, and God decided that that message now needed to go beyond Syria, out into the Mediterranean Sea, to Cyprus, and beyond. So let's circle back to where we started today in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. You know, and specifically, we're just looking at the, the, the sending of these two men. They fasted, they prayed, they placed their hands on them, sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia, down by the coast, and then sailed from there to Cyprus. Now, note the reaction that after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off on their way by the Holy Spirit to Cyprus. It's God's way of telling Barnabas and Saul and the church in Antioch that it's time to move. The Spirit spoke and the church listened. In order for Barnabas and Saul to obey, they needed to be released. And they were. And talk about change. This wasn't a pleasure cruise for Barnabas and Saul. As we're going to see, life became pretty dicey pretty quick for them. It was so difficult that John Mark, an individual I mentioned earlier before and, and someone we're going to look at more closely in the coming weeks, he left the team and he returned home. And that was something that made Paul very unhappy. And then they go to Lystra, where Saul was stoned and left for dead. They left the relative comforts of Antioch and the Antioch Church of Christ for this sort of reception. Whether in times of relative ease or complete hardship, the primary principle stands. Obedience requires change. So, as we, as we close this lesson, we need to be prepared for the change that may come in our lives. And we've seen this over the last several months, haven't we? Never before the, the latter part of the winter of this year had we ever thought of or contemplated the idea that we would have to shelter in place, have to stay home to stay safe, 
have to think about the idea of worshiping not in person with one another, but in spirit with one another, using the technology that we're, we're using today, using the streaming technology that is afforded to us. I'm so thankful that God's perfect plan for us allowed us to make this transition to this sort of community in a way that allows us still to stay together. And while I know that it, it's, it's not fun <laughs> to do this, and while I miss hugging and shaking hands with our brothers and sisters in Christ, it's encouraging to know that God prepared us for this, that God made us able to change, able to be molded, capable of thinking differently about how we can gather together in spirit with one another. And while this time of change and this time of transition, we hope will be brief and we pray will be brief, isn't it encouraging to know that when we do come out the other side, that we were able to stay united together with one another through our faith and love in Jesus Christ, in unity and in spirit with one another. I praise God for that, and I praise God for each and every one of you that is a part of our brotherhood here at Preston Crest and for those that are watching this elsewhere, brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank you all for watching these, uh, these lessons and for responding in, with such kind and generous comments. I'm, I'm encouraged by those, but my continued prayer is that uh, while Luke and while Paul are the most able storytellers that we have, that the Spirit allows me to carry these stories forward to you. If you would join me uh, in, in a brief word of prayer, we'll close out our lesson for today until we can gather again next week where we're going to begin the study of Paul's missionary journeys. Bow with me if you would. Dear God in heaven, we are so thankful that you are our God, that you are powerful and loving and all-knowing. We ask that you help us to be like clay rather than like pottery. We, help us, we, we pray that you help us to know that you love us so much that you not only sent your son to live with us, to die for us, but that you empowered men like Barnabas and like Paul, Barnabas to encourage others and Paul to take this message far beyond the borders of, of the Antioch Church of Christ, but across the Mediterranean Sea to where we can now gather here today and not only talk about Paul, but to learn from him the message of the gospel that he carried so ably. Lord, we ask your continued blessing on our congregation. We ask for wisdom and guidance. We ask for protection. We ask for a spirit of peace, and we ask for your forgiveness for all that we do that's not loving and is not showing the love that you have for us through our lives. Help people to know whose we are by how we treat one another. And it's through the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Thank you again. We'll see you next week.